Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 1. In the last video, we looked at two different ways of modeling the behavior of gases, the ideal gas law and the van der Waals equation. We saw that these two equations can give us very different predictions of the properties of a gas, such as pressure and temperature. Today, we'll look at more behaviors predicted by these two models, and we'll also look at another model that makes even more accurate predictions than the van der Waals equation. Let's start out by thinking about what happens when we compress a gas. As we apply pressure to a gas, the volume decreases. That's exactly what Boyle's law predicts, and so does the van der Waals equation and the ideal gas law. One way we can describe the compression of a gas is using what's called the compressibility factor. Here's how it works. We start with the ideal gas law. We start with this version, which uses the intensive variable V bar, the molar volume of the gas. If you've forgotten what an intensive variable is, you might want to review the previous video where we talked about extensive and intensive variables. Now we'll just divide both sides by r times t, so we get p v bar over r t equals 1. This fraction is called the compressibility factor, and we give it the symbol z. The important thing to notice about this equation is that, according to the ideal gas law, this fraction should always be equal to 1. But how does that compare to reality? If we plot z for several different gases as we increase the pressure, here's what we get. The horizontal line here is the prediction that the ideal gas law makes. As we just saw, the ideal gas law predicts that z should always be equal to 1. As you can see, real gases behave much differently. Real gases have z lower than 1 at low pressure, and these values decrease for a while, and then at high pressures, they increase and are eventually higher than 1. Even helium, which is the green line, dips below 1 briefly at very low pressures. So, what's the reason for this behavior? At very, very low pressures, all the curves have a compression factor near 1. That's because the molecules are extremely far apart from one another, so they don't feel any attractions or repulsions for each other. That means they behave essentially like ideal gases, and so the compressibility factor is nearly 1. However, once they're compressed together, they do start to feel intermolecular forces like London dispersion and dipole-dipole interaction. The attractions make the molecules move closer together, so the volume shrinks more than we might expect. That makes the curves dip below the z equals 1 line. But sooner or later, the molecules get so close together that they begin to repel each other. The electrons in one molecule feel repulsion from the electrons of other molecules. That means the molecules will stop moving closer together even when the pressure is very high. So the gas will stop shrinking, and the curve will climb higher until it's above z equals 1. Notice how the curves are different for the gases shown here. Helium barely decreases below the z equals 1 line before the curve begins to rise. That's because helium contains very few electrons, and so there's very little chance for London dispersion to cause attractions between the helium atoms. On the other hand, oxygen contains 16 electrons, and several of those are in unshared electron pairs, which means that they're able to move more freely around in the molecules than electrons that are in bonds. So, there's a much greater likelihood that London dispersion forces will have a chance to form between the oxygen molecules, and the curve dips much further below the z equals 1 line than the other molecules in this graph. The effect would be even greater for polar molecules like water, because they experience strong attractions for one another. We'd expect the curve to dip even farther below the line for those gases. So far, we've been looking at how z changes with pressure at one particular temperature. But it's also interesting to look at how the temperature can change the compressibility factor. Here's a plot similar to the last one. The red lines are for helium, the blue ones for air, and the green ones are for oxygen. However, notice that there are three plots for each of those gases. Let's look at the ones for oxygen. As you can see in the legend, curve A was measured at 10 degrees Celsius, curve B was at 20 degrees, and curve C was at 30. Notice that as the temperature increases, the curve gets closer to the z equals 1 line. The same thing is true for all three of these gases. For example, the top helium curve is for 10 degrees, the middle is for 20, 
and the lowest curve is for 30 degrees Celsius. Why does this happen? The reason is that when molecules are moving very quickly, there's not enough time for London dispersion to cause the molecules to attract each other. For that reason, every gas should behave more and more like an ideal gas as the temperature rises, because fast-moving molecules will feel fewer intermolecular forces than molecules that move slowly. So, to sum up, the compressibility factor shows us that molecules behave more like ideal gases when the temperature is very high and also when the pressure is very low. For that reason, it's usually not wise to use the ideal gas at high pressures or low temperatures. Another interesting thing to look at is the connection between pressure and volume. Boyle's law tells us that pressure and volume are inversely proportional, but that's only completely true for ideal gases. Let's try making a plot of pressure versus volume for an ideal gas. When we do, we get a curve like this. These are pressure volume plots for an ideal gas, each at a different temperature. The curves all look about the same, but notice that the curves are higher up on the graph as the temperature increases. Each of these curves is called an isotherm, which is a word that means same temperature, because each of them shows us how the pressure and volume are related at a single temperature. So, what the shape of these curves tells us is that as we raise the pressure, the volume decreases. That's pretty much what we expect from Boyle's Law. But now let's take a look at the curves we get by using the van der Waals equation instead. This time, the isotherms look very different. At a high temperature, the curve looks basically the same as it did for the ideal gas law. That makes sense. Remember, we said that gases behave more like ideal gases at high temperatures. But look at what happens as the temperature goes down. We start to see that the isotherms develop a flattened area as the temperature decreases. Based on these plots, it looks like this gas would have a perfectly horizontal area in the curve when the temperature is somewhere between 285 and 300 Kelvin. Let's think about what that's telling us. For the blue curve, the volume decreases as we increase the pressure, just as it does with the ideal gas law. But at a certain pressure, the curve becomes horizontal, which means that the gas experiences a sudden large reduction in volume. What does that mean? What's happening at that pressure? The answer is that the gas is suddenly becoming a liquid. At lower temperatures, like the one represented by the blue curve, the molecules have slowed down enough to allow the intermolecular forces to attract the molecules to each other, and that's what needs to happen in order for a gas to change into a liquid. When that happens, there's a sudden drop in volume, because liquids are always more dense than gases. Notice that, at even colder temperatures, the isotherm actually dips down. That seems to mean that the pressure suddenly drops as the volume decreases. That doesn't seem to make sense. And if it seems strange to you, good! It actually is an error. It's an error caused by the fact that the van der Waals equation is itself just a, an approximation. The van der Waals equation correctly predicts that, at low temperature and pressure, a gas will become a liquid. But at lower temperatures than that, even the van der Waals equation breaks down and starts giving us bad predictions like this one. That's because the van der Waals equation and the ideal gas law were both designed just to be used for gases. When we have a gas that has become liquefied, these equations no longer give us a picture of what those substances are doing. The temperature at which we get this horizontal isotherm is called the critical temperature. Above the critical temperature, the substance can only be a gas, no matter what the pressure is. But below that temperature, the gas will be able to liquefy at some pressures. So far, we've seen two equations that describe the behavior of gases, the ideal gas law and the van der Waals equation. These are both called equations of state. That's just a term for an equation that models the connection between the pressure, volume, and temperature of a gas. As we just saw a minute ago, both of these equations are really just approximations, so we have to be careful about when we use them. But there is an equation of state that can give us exact results, at least in principle. It's called the virial equation, and it looks like this. 
Notice that on the left, we have PV bar over RT, which is the compressibility factor we looked at earlier. On the right side, we have an infinite series of terms. The first term is just one, and each of the other terms has v bar in the denominator raised to an exponent that increases by one with every term. In the numerator is a term called a virial coefficient. This is a function that depends on the temperature. That's what the t in parentheses tells us. b is called the second virial coefficient because it's in the second term. c is the third virial coefficient, and so on. Each of them is really a function, and each of those functions contains t as a variable. So what are those virial coefficients? What are the functions that they represent? It turns out that the answer is different for every gas. So if we want to use the virial equation, we need to look them up. In general, the second virial coefficient describes the intermolecular forces between any two molecules of the gas. The third virial coefficient describes the interactions between any three molecules, and so on. And that's why this is an infinite series. In principle, we could have a term in this equation for interactions between any three molecules, any four, any five, or any 50 million molecules, which would mean that we need 50 million terms in the equation. Of course, we could never do that, but usually we don't even need to. That's because each of these fractions will be smaller than the one before it. For that reason, we usually only use the first two or three terms of the virial equation. Notice that if we only use the first term, we have PV bar divided by RT equals 1. That's exactly what we got from the ideal gas law. So we can think of the virial equation as the ideal gas law with a series of correction terms added to it, each of them fine-tuning the equation so that it becomes a little bit more accurate. Well, that's enough new material for now. In the next video, we'll start a new chapter, and we'll take a really detailed look at the motions of these gas molecules, and we'll find out that there are a lot of unexpected things we can learn about their properties. I hope you'll join me for that. Until next time, have a good week.